You know, one of the things, there's a recent study done by PepsiCo, who owns Tropicana Orange Juice, that showed up in the New York Times. And this is a telling story about agriculture's contribution to climate change. Uh, in this country, in the United States, a lot of nitrogen fertilizer is often used. Well, when they did a study on what was the carbon footprint of Tropicana Orange Juice, they really expected it was going to be refrigeration or processing or packaging. They were very surprised to learn 60% of the carbon footprint of Tropicana orange juice was nitrogen fertilizer. So when you talk about conventional synthetic chemical-based agriculture, what's its contribution? One of its biggest contributions from a carbon footprint, a greenhouse gas contributing entity, is this fertilizer and then the pesticides and herbicides. So as you also erode the soil organic matter through the use of those chemicals, a lot of that carbon is released in the atmosphere. Again, if we didn't have a different way to farm, we'd be stuck with it. But we do have a different way to farm, and we need to incentivize farmers to make this change to a biological effort. It will sequester the carbon, it will reduce the carbon emissions of these synthetics, and it will give us cleaner, safer food. Soil carbon sequestration is pretty easy because we all learned it in our biology classes. And we just go back to that time and think, we were taught about photosynthesis. You know, carbon dioxide lives in the atmosphere. We breathe it out, too. Plants through their leaves take that carbon dioxide and break it apart, releasing oxygen for us to breathe in a pure form. And at the same time, it incorporates that carbon into its own plant structure, into the cellulose and the lignin that builds the roots and the stem and the leaf of the plant. So what happens is, is then a lot of that carbohydrate goes down into the root and feeds some of the microorganisms in the soil. And some of those organisms, like the mycorrhizal fungi, want to hold that carbon in the soil for maybe up to 100 years. Well, that's pretty powerful. Plus, all of that root zone activity and the shedding of that root into the soil and if that plant can go back into the soil. We're starting to put it there and the biology will want to hold it there for longer term. So we don't want to disturb our soil a whole bunch. We actually want to let sort of biological tilling take place, less tractor tilling. But the plant will take the carbon out of the atmosphere and the plant will send a lot of it down into the soil and the microbiology there will start to work that and keep a lot of it there for a long time. We have to be careful of our practices. We have to keep this focus in mind, but we can build soil carbon levels, build soil health, build food producing capacity, build water holding capacity. Well, as you see, there's a lot of ecosystem services and it's a benefit to all of life on the planet. Regenerative agriculture, you know, sometimes goes a little bit beyond just an organic statement. Organic agriculture could and should and often is regenerative. But sometimes you can farm organically and bring outside inputs in that don't really build soil. But regenerative agriculture that Bob Rodale had talked about years ago has this added component of literally thinking about how you're going to build the soil each year. So it regenerates. You know, in the U.S. we're losing about 1% of our top soil annually. That's our biggest export, topsoil going down the rivers. That's not sustainable. That's not investing in future generations. And we have to think of how do we build it back? Well, we can build it back through these biological, ecological farming systems. When you build soil carbon through organic matter in the soil, you're not only sequestering and taking this carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, at the same time, you are also building an adaptive quality, a resilience in that soil. So that in fact, if you're short of water and you're in a drought condition because of climate crisis, you have more of a chance of getting a crop. You don't have a dead soil that all of a sudden the plant wilts and goes away. You have mycorrhizae reaching out and pulling that moisture that's in a sponge-like condition held in that organic matter to the plant. So the plant can still grow and still probably produce a crop. It is the only true buffer against drought. We know that animals can be a contributor to climate change with respect to questions around methane, but a lot of the amount of methane produced has to do with diet. We also know that ruminants are crucial to the biodiversity of the planet, and there were 60, billion, 60 million excuse me, bison on this continent before the settlers came. Now we have 90 million cattle. The problem is industrial models have put them in a concentrated system that has produced unhealthy animals, 
concentrations of nitrates in the animal waste and created pollution to water and aquifer. So we know that it's a problem. If we were to return those animals to grazing lands and manage them well, we can actually build the robustness back of those grazing lands and sequester an awful lot of carbon. And how that works is very simple. When you manage ruminants well on grasses, and remember ruminants and grasses evolve together, they're part of the whole evolutionary process of life on this planet, as a grass grows up, its roots go down and its grass top grows up and there's kind of a mirror image between the amount of carbon above ground and the amount below. And when the ruminant eats that grass down, the roots are shed and that carbon's left in the soil. We're making soil, we're making biology when that happens. So if we can get that animal off that grass and let it robustly come back and grow, we again get that much root growth below, we're building soil, we're putting carbon back in the ground, and here's where the ruminants and grasses help all of us. It actually adds to the whole biodiversity of our planet. It's a crucial element and one we shouldn't forget. In our equations of animals' impacts, they also have a benefit. It's not an either-or question. True famine prevention is going to be how we build resilient soils, soils that can produce food in times of climate crisis how we build systems that don't take outside inputs and so that farmers that are subsistence level or less can actually grow food on their land and year after year count on that food. It's also, I think the research here has shown us that we can build soils pretty rapidly. So it's a way for farmers around the world to build the capacity of their soils to grow more food. You know, one of the things that I, I've thought about quite a bit is when we really understand how fast we can build soils, the question isn't necessarily in feeding nine billion people in the future, how much more land will it take? I think we should reverse that question and say, in building more soils, how many more people can we feed on less land, not more? But we haven't addressed the question that way yet. Let us begin.